Hey everybody, welcome to Classic Movie Guest number 25. That's a big round number, so we're going to do a big movie. In fact, one of the biggest ever, probably the most watched film of all time, celebrating its 75th anniversary from 1939, The Wizard of Oz. The wonderful Wizard of Oz. Woohoo! Because, 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 because it's the kind of things we does. And Data. Melissa, do you, do you even need to explain what The Wizard of Oz is about? I mean, well, do you think that just about everybody has seen this movie? I do. I mean, honestly, I would feel kind of silly explaining it because I, I really hope that everybody has seen it. You know what I mean? So, uh, it's you know, the story of Dorothy Gale and her magical dream through. A uh, distant land filled with munchkins and witches and all sorts of stuff. Trees. So iconic, isn't it? <coughs> it's crazy iconic. I guess we should begin with the main players. Probably. I mean, Dorothy's kind of an obvious one to start with. <laughs> okay, so where does Dorothy come from? Where does The Wizard of Oz come from? The books were written starting in 1900 by uh, L. Frank Baum. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dorothy Gale was kind of this Midwestern, you know, girl. And uh, mm -hmm. all in all, there were 13 <laughs> books. I think Baum ended up writing like one a year until his death in, I believe, 1919. So he had actually passed away 20 years before this film was even made. The Wizard of Oz was technically astounding. And it probably would have won way more awards if not for what? Gone with the Wind, which was nominated the same year. <laughs> yeah. Movie too. What a year for films. And interestingly enough, the director of, uh, of well, I guess we should say what, the main director for Gone with the Wind um, was also the director, the main director mm -hmm. for Wizard of Oz. Um, yep. So that's where the story came from. It had been done on stage. Wizard of Oz had been done in silent films. There was many variations of it, uh, but nothing like the 1939 version. So, of course, Dorothy is played by Judy Garland. What can you tell me about young Judy? Well, she was, what, like 15 or 16 when she got the role for this part? But she wasn't originally the first one that they wanted to have play. They looked at, like, Shirley Temple. They looked at Deanna Durbin, who was amazing. I think they looked at several other people. But when she was cast, there were people that were like, she's too old for the role. But she really, she did amazing in it. They had to make her look like a little girl in many ways. And, like, okay, this is one of the things that I thought was cool. One of the original directors had her kind of a little bit more as a glamorous Dorothy like with blonde hair and baby doll makeup. And for the final, or the, I think then George Cukor came in as the yeah. director at that point, and he was like, no, she's a kid, and she needs to look whimsical. And so they got her the blue checkered dress and um, gave her braids and just made her look younger. He gave her dark hair. That was Dark cute. hair, yep. Who was yep. working on Gone with the Wind. Yeah. And um, he's also the Philadelphia Story director as well. Yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. um, he did Born Yesterday. Yeah. He did Born Yesterday, too. Ooh, yeah. It, it's amazing. To be at Hollywood at that time, um, I was fascinated to learn that five directors, in fact, worked on The Wizard of Oz. Now, Victor Fleming um, was pretty much there most of the way uh, until Clark Gable basically got <laughs> Cukor fired from Gone with the Wind because they weren't talking, and he called Victor Fleming and said, hey, can you come over and save Gone with the Wind? And so Fleming um, had King Vidor come in and finish the last couple weeks of Wizard of Oz, which included the very iconic uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Yep. And, uh, you know, did, did you hear that they, they tried to cut that? No. Yeah. Didn't they show it to, like... Well, they showed it to like a preview audience, and it was really long. And they thought it was like they thought it was like degrading for her to be singing in a barn in or a barn in a barnyard yard. or something. What? Come on, have you ever been to the Midwest? That's not degrading. <laughs> like, but I'm really You're glad they're always singing in barnyards, huh? <laughs> All the time, but I do. Um, but yeah, I'm glad they kept it in though, because I mean, even just for Judy Garland, that became like her song and her legacy, really. Um, but and, arguably, and it's, it's the most famous song in the history of cinema. Yeah, and it I think it won it won an Academy Award, didn't it? It that did. It got, the they got best, yeah. best original song. Um, yeah, Judy Garland won an Academy Award for best performance by a juvenile or best juvenile yeah, performance. I, yeah. 
And I thought it was fascinating that um, when it came time to release the film, of course MGM was the giant, and Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland were like the teen icons of the day. Yep. So it was they had fifteen thousand people lined up around the corner to get in just because Rooney and Garland would perform like a song and dance thing after the film. After the show. premiere, yeah. But the actual <laughs> movie, a lot of people just didn't understand it. They didn't get it. People were walking out. The film was so expensive to make, it actually lost a little bit of money, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty amazing because it, it clearly topped the one billion mark uh, <laughs> in, 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 in growing. Um, more people probably have seen The Wizard of Oz than any film in history. And it's because of such a lovable and timeless story. Um, but let's be honest, it's a little scary. Oh, it creeped me out completely as a kid. The flying monkeys? Seriously, those are scary. <laughs> and I was scared of flower fields for a long time as a kid. <laughs> you were scared <laughs> of flower fields? But, um... What did you th did you think flying monkeys would come, or that you would be, like, passing out? I thought I would pass out, you know, because that's what happens in that happy <laughs> field. That's great. I did. I did. Wow. Um, but anyway... Who could have but, played the witch like Margaret Hamilton? Nobody. But... So we both watched a documentary on this and learned that there was somebody else they had cast to play her first. They were going to try to make her like like a sleek and modern type witch. What was they, her name? Now I, I bet we both forget. I, I can't remember. She was like one of MGM's big stars under contract. Yeah. And so she, but then there was kind of an outcry because everybody's like, dude, that's not the Wicked Witch of the West. She's not supposed to be like that. And so they got Margaret Hamilton to do it. And she did amazing at it. And actually, Actually, they cut a ton of Margaret Hamilton's scenes because they actually thought it was too scary for kids. When I was a kid, I always wanted to watch The Wizard of Oz, but I could not. Um, I could not do it unless <laughs> like you have to fast forward this witch scene. I needed I needed my mom to watch it with me, <laughs> uh, but she didn't like the film so much. So she was always like, "Oh, please, do we have to? <laughs> do we have to watch this again." Um, but it was just like the kind of story where you wanted to like curl up during the scary witch scenes. Oh, yeah. just, everybody was always wait. I was always waiting for the scarecrow. Ray Bolger and the scarecrow is my favorite character. The amazing thing about Ray Bolger, he doesn't have like a super distinguished career outside of Wizard of Oz. Um, but he had been in a number of films in the 1930s. Uh, Siegfried Follies, I think, was was one of them that he was with that troupe. And if you looked at the way he danced, that that was like his crazy style. He was skinny mm -hmm. than Jimmy Stewart, and um, he was originally cast to play the Tin Man. Right. So he was so angry, he goes to the uh, office of whoever I guess it was mayor or whatever, and he demanded to be cast as the Scarecrow. He convinced them of that. Um, and then the Tin Woodsman was going to be played by Buddy Epson. Buddy Epson, yeah. Who is famous for uh, the Beverly Hillbillies. But that didn't work out. Yeah. What happened? Well, he almost died. <laughs> Seriously, everybody had issues because of their costumes in this movie. But, um, yeah, it was it aluminum or something? There was something in the powder that he had to yeah. wear with his, makeup. with his makeup that got into his lungs, and he had a horrible allergic reaction and ended up in the hospital. Yeah, poor guy. As you can imagine, he never really got over that. It was no. definitely a slight. They uh, replaced him with uh, the man who became the Tin Man that we all know, Jack Haley, uh, yeah. and they changed the makeup to a different kind of. I don't know how you know science, whatever. But they they <laughs> made it safer, and they didn't even like talk about it. Imagine, you know, today the kind of lawsuit and everything they I would know. Have. But seriously, everybody had issues. He had that the like the lion's costume was like a hundred pounds, and he was overheating every day in it. Um, the witch, uh, Margaret Hamilton, she had something in the makeup of hers that when she got near where like some fire and, and lights were gonna go off, she basically got burned in the face because of hers. It was it's very yeah. Dangerous well, that, let's in. talk about that. That's a really famous. Um, Bert Lahr is the uh, is the cowardly lion, but the famous scene when the witch disappears from Munchkinland and she kind of spins into that mm -hmm. um, that orange sulfur like powder. The take that we see on film is the first take, and that's the one that went well. Back in those days, it took so long for them to get prints back. They they didn't know if they got the shot or not, so they constantly had to like film backup takes even when everything looked perfect. 
So they came back from lunch, they set the scene up again, and they refilmed it a second time. And there was like this elevator that would drop out from under her. And as she was mm-hmm. falling, the explosion caught the makeup on her face. It caught it on fire and on her hand, the green. Uh, and it was a copper-based paint. And someone down there caught her and like ran her and washed <laughs> off the makeup because it was continuing to burn. Um, so it would have it would have been really horrible. She went to the hospital for weeks to recuperate. When her little boy came into the hospital to visit her, she basically had her whole face wrapped up except for her left <laughs> eye. Oh, sad. Uh, they told the nurses that mommy has a really great costume on. She's actually dressed like a mummy. And so <laughs> when the little boy came in, uh, he got to pretend that his mummy was a mummy, and she <laughs> she played uh, as it was a part of the joke. And he never was any wiser Aww. until he older. What a good mom. <laughs> yeah. She, had, she ended up being in hundreds of roles. Um, it was funny, though. You know, you think a movie of this scope, uh, like if you were in a movie in the 90s or the last 20 years that had this kind of um, success, you know, the residuals alone would just be exorbitant. You could live off it mm-hmm. forever. And none of those actors got anything. Um, Ray Bolger always said, we didn't get residuals, but we got immortality. And um, and Margaret Hamilton's son said that she actually made more money years later as the coffee lady or whatever in a commercial <laughs> than the 8000 bucks she got for her whatever few weeks of work. She only got $8,000? Holy cow. Do you know that her screen time in the film is like 12 minutes? Well, yeah, because they cut so much of it down. Like That's crazy. She's so, so dominant. Scary. Yeah. <laughs> The scenes that she's in are so memorable. I mean, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. Think about the franchising. You know, when you look at the impact of Oz, I don't know if any other movie quite has impacted culture like this one. I mean, Wicked is kind of a big deal. Wasn't there just a movie last year? Yeah, the new uh, Oz the Great and Powerful. Do you yeah. remember the dark side of Oz when the Pink Floyd story broke and they were like, Yeah, well. I don't really remember it, but... <laughs> wow. Everybody was like, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon is synced up perfectly. Yeah. Um, they did not do it intentionally, but like you could still go to theaters and you can watch the movie with Pink Floyd it's so playing. Crazy. And it is really creepy. I don't know if you've ever watched it, like how it syncs up. Uh-huh. It's, it's wild. Um, and, you know, stories, the urban legend, that isn't there a little person who commits oh, yeah. suicide in the back? That's not true, by the way. Yeah. That's not, there was not a suicide in the background of the dancing scene. <laughs> well, don't they say it's like a bird or something that's actually yeah. there? Okay. Yeah, they like just had wildlife running around, I guess, to <laughs> give scope to the whole thing. <laughs> actually, one of the most amazing things to me about Wizard of Oz, just even thinking about wildlife or just in general, back in the 1930s, none of the technology exists to make the things that you can make so easily today on film. A tornado would be nothing. They had to they had to basically make a miniature tornado, you know, in order for it to show up on screen. It was crazy. Today, with special effects and CGI, you could do that no problem. Well, they had to create a, a miniature house and drop it from the top of the set and film it and then reverse their film. I mean, they just did so much work for these little moments in the movie that today it would be nothing, you know? Yeah, I was I was looking somewhere. Um, it might have been in the documentary you and I watched that actually the tornado, like they made this funnel and it was like thirty feet high and they, mm-hmm. it, it looks it looked really good considering what they were doing back then. They made it out of like muslin or something, and then just had a bunch of dust and water and wind that they created to make it look real. And it, it yeah, it looks so real. It's amazing. What's your favorite part? Ooh, I don't know. I love, when I was a kid, I loved when Dorothy first came into to the Munchkin Land and it was colorful and they sang and everything. When I got a little bit older, I got more excited when they were finally going to the witches area and encountering the monkeys and all of that when I was past scared being scared of it. Yeah. Yeah, I was always a little bit, I don't know why, but the ending always made me kind of sad. I was always like, really, Dorothy? You're going to go back to Kansas? Like, you're in this amazing <laughs> place. What are you doing? <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, dreams, um, dreams these days is like a surefire way to be called cheap and to ruin yeah. your movie ending, yeah. you know? 
Um, it's interesting. So the film was not received um, because a lot of people just didn't get it. They were like, this is super creepy. I mean, <laughs> it, at that time, even the actors, to see like 125 little people brought in to perform, like it was just unheard of. Um, so what happened apparently was the film went came and went in 1939. It was recognized as a huge you know, sensation, um, but it had been costly. It lost a little bit of money, and it, there was a 1949 re-release 10 years later, um, and it was in bargain matinees and stuff like that. But apparently in 1956, it made its national television debut. And by that point in the 1950s, households in America really had a lot of TVs, and they said 45 million people tuned in to watch. So it was really from 1956 on that the popularity of the film exploded because of television. Uh, the other thing I thought was interesting is they were trying to, when they were originally writing the story, they were trying to make some kind of contemporary feel that would give it popularity among young people. And so very, they had the, the jitterbug, you know, mm -hmm. if you picture that dance style of the 1930s. So there's this scene they cut out of Dorothy and the Scarecrow and Howard <laughs> the Lion and the Tin Woodsman dancing the jitterbug, and they had a whole song and dance. And uh, one of the uh, one of the guys had home movies of the set, and like you could see them performing this thing. I, w I was like, that's so fascinating. They kind of synced up this home movie to the jitterbug song. Did you see that? <laughs> I don't think I saw that. I I've seen actually Wizard of Oz performed on stage where they did the jitterbug number, and okay. I remember when I saw it, I was like, dude, that does not fit in. No wonder they left it out of the movie, but. It does make sense if they were trying to like be somewhat relatable to their audience, especially when they're doing this kind of crazy fantasy type movie. You know, you ever see that movie with Heath Ledger and Knight's Tale? Mm -hmm. And like all of a sudden, in the middle of the movie, they're at a banquet and they start doing the "We Will Rock You" dance number. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was like even that was weird in like 1996. <laughs> it was like trying to think of that in 1939. Really out of the box yeah. is where they were. That's a good comparison. Um, speaking of stage, obviously Judy Garland um, was a legend. She also died young. She mm -hmm. had a very troubled life, and she was only 16, so I think she lived to be 46, 47 years old. And Liza Minnelli is her very famous daughter. Um, I learned while reading up on the film that Liza Minnelli apparently married Jack Haley Jr. So oh, really? Dorothy's real-life daughter married the Tin Woodsman's real-life son. That's funny. Yeah. I guess that's verified. But it took 14 <laughs> writers to bring this um, yeah. adaptation from the books to the screen. And Noah Langley was only 26. He was a key. He's the one who turned the silver slippers into ruby slippers. Mm -hmm. He came up with There's No Place Like Home. And he was the one, who, and this was kind of like done, I think, in one of the stage versions or one of the early film versions, to actually say what if these characters were paralleled um, as yeah. farmhands. Um, so, I don't know, it's just so fascinating how those two worlds are are developed in this version, this movie version. Yeah. And you mentioned how young he, Noah Langley was. Mervyn Leroy, or Leroy, I think he was like the head yeah. of production or something at MGM. He was only like 37 or 38 when he yeah. became basically the, not only the head of this movie, but the head of production at MGM and made one of like we've said, like the most viewed movies of all time. Can you imagine? I mean, that's that's like young to all of a sudden be put at the head of this huge, huge movie. That's crazy. That was a one thing that I was like, whoa. He discovered like Clark Gable and I don't remember who else. Loretta Young. One of the um, amazing. I always get the names mixed up. I mean, there's Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Louis Mayer is the one that everybody knows. Like Cohen or someone died. And so this guy was like the next man up. He was kind of like a Hollywood whiz kid. Um, what's his name? Leroy Melvin, you said? Mervyn Leroy. Mervyn Leroy. I get it. And, and he, won, he always had wanted to do this because people like mm -hmm. people knew this book. It would be like if Harry Potter had never been made into mm -hmm. a film 40 years from now. Right. And um, he wanted to direct it. And he was told right away, like, not a chance. It's going to be gonna get a direct, way, yeah. way too big. So he produced the whole thing and... Yeah, pretty good one to have your name on. <laughs> no kidding. Said. No kidding. So what else should people know about The Wizard of Oz? Well. We're not even oh. talking about the story. I guess the assumption <laughs> is nobody knows. Yeah. We could talk about The Wizard. It's kind of cool. So Frank Morgan played The Wizard. Yes. 
And I did not realize this, that they went through so many people trying to find somebody to play that role and had trouble getting people to accept it. And so they fleshed it out and let that role, um, that whoever took that role didn't just play the wizard, but played like four other roles in the movie. And I knew that the wizard played, or that Frank Morgan played um, whatever he is, the guy at the beginning with the turban. I knew that he played that. Professor. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't remember that he played like three other roles in the movie, like the the doorkeeper, I think, and then, gosh, I don't even remember. But it's five different roles that this one guy got to do. He is the he's Professor Marvel. He's the wizard. He's the gatekeeper. Who rang that bell? Yeah. <laughs> nice. He is the guard, um, and he's also a very quick one that I never knew. He's a uh, like carriage driver. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like all the people. W.C. Fields was going to play the wizard. I think it was W.C. Fields, but he got hung up on uh, demanding too much money, money and the contract money. negotiations yeah. dragged on. So they turned to Frank Morgan, who is like super versatile. Yeah. Because how many times have you seen the movie and you don't even realize that he's all... But I know. All of those he's characters. all his roles. <laughs> Oh, and you mentioned the carriage. So the horses, you know, the horses that turn colors, that was another favorite of mine as a kid. They used, like, jello powder to make the horses turn colors, which is kind of awesome. <laughs> yeah, those horses. And everybody talks, of course, about, you know, they were called munchkins at the time. They were called, um, you know, midgets. Today we call them little people. They <laughs> lamented forever the fact that they only made $50 a week and that Toto... Uh, yeah. Made one hundred and twenty-five dollars a week. Yeah. Toto was a actually a female. I forget what kind of a terrier. Um, had been in a number of a films. I think uh, lived to be I don't know ten years like, old or something like, like that. A few years yeah. past Wizard of Oz, but Toto is pretty iconic. Yeah. I always thought it was so cool when I was a kid. Like, well, Mrs. Galt, like she's so scary, and right from the beginning, you're just like she's the worst. I always thought it was so cool how Toto escaped. From <laughs> Outwitted her, got away. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and you just love you just love uh, Auntie M uh, so much when they stick up for Dorothy. Mm-hmm. Just good aunt. She's so mean. She's a good aunt. Yeah, such great characters. Oh, the entire scarecrow scene that was cut. The entire dance. I scene. know. They should have left that in. That was I had not seen that before, and then Me either. And, yeah, that was amazing to watch. So what happens is it's it's early on when it's just Dorothy and the Scarecrow, and they have Toto gets into the pumpkin patch, and this big pumpkin rolls down the yellow brick road, and it hits the Scarecrow, and he goes, like, flying up into the sky. But then he ends up, like, in this dance number where he runs bouncing from fence post to fence post, and they're kind of, like, rubberized. And he was just so athletic. He had this, you know, real fun kind of uh, dancing style. Uh, but the whole thing got cut. They were constantly worried that the movie was going to be too long if they didn't narrow it down more. Mm -hmm. How disheartening would that be though? And it, it's not like today where deleted scenes we save them and put them on the DVD or the Blu-ray and you know like if you're if you're cut then you're just cut and half the time the film wasn't even saved you know? Yeah. Sad. It is uh, but this one certainly has been preserved constantly ranked in the top ten. It was actually in the top five or six and then recently we were looking at lists um, of the highest rankings I think it fell down to like number nine or ten, um, but it's just so iconic. There's not much out there that can really match Wizard of Oz for cultural presence. Um, it, it appealed to kids and adults alike. Um, nobody ever forgets the first time you see Dorothy open the door and go from black and white into color. That was still mm -hmm. magical in the, you know the '80s, '90s, and today. So. Um, Pretty amazing film, huge money maker, huge cultural impression. What else would you add about The Wizard of Oz? Well, that if you haven't seen it, that it's probably time to join humanity and watch it. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's on TV all the time. It's it really, is. It's a great, it's a fun movie. The songs will get stuck in your head and drive you crazy, but other than that, it's a great movie. <laughs> oh, and then, you know, everybody's, everybody's high school has done a stage version. You, mm -hmm. you have to. You have to mm -hmm. see at least one Wizard of Oz, Oz, yeah. Oz stage Osh, version. Osh. And then go see Wicked, because it's pretty a cool twisting of the story as well. I like Wicked. Very cool. So there it is. For, for the big number 25 gush, we had to hit a big one. So 
Wizard of Oz certainly has earned its place in movie history, certainly in classic movie legend. So let us know, what do you think of The Wizard of Oz? What's your favorite character or favorite scene, if you can't just pick one? Favorite um, song. And if you're out there and you just straight up hate The Wizard of Oz, be honest. We know some people <laughs> just don't like that movie. Tell us why. Um, so we'll see you next time with a new... I'm the great and powerful Oz. I really can't take this seriously. <laughs> oh, because we're always so serious. Yeah.